Okay, welcome back guys. This is going to be video two of the ENT practice questions. So I'll pick up where we left off. We just finished with neurosyphilis and Argel Robinson pupil. So next question is a patient that has a pituitary adenoma resulting in a lesion to the optic chiasm only. What visual defect would this lead to? So again, lesion of the optic chiasm, what visual defect would this lead to? Another question, a patient has a lesion in the left optic tract. What visual defect is this going to lead to? So to answer these questions and explain them a little bit, I have a diagram here. So the first one is going to be equivalence number two here. That's going to be bitemporal, both temples, heteronymous, not the same side, hemianopsia. The second one is going to be contralateral, homonymous, hemianopsia. So the first one to explain it here, here in number two, you can see on the picture that there's a lesion here in this optic chiasm, and it's affecting the two medial tracts of both eyes. So if we're affecting the two medial tracts of both eyes, here the green and the red, then we're going to have inability to sense information on this side of the eye on both these medial sides. Therefore, that's going to lead to a disruption in the vision on the lateral side as each side of the eye takes from the opposite side. So this medial side and this medial side are going to receive from both temporal sides. And as you can see corresponding to the image here, we're going to have black here and here, meaning that we're going to have visual impairment on these both lateral sides. So a lesion in the optic chiasm, again, goes to the medial portion of the eye, which leads you to have a visual defect on both lateral sides. And the other one, contralateral homonymous hemianopsia, contralateral with this left optic track defect here, we're going to have um, destruction of the red and the yellow in this picture. So both the lateral on the left eye and the medial on the right eye. So again, so they're going to be looking on this left eye, it's going to be looking medially. And that's where the information is going to be lost. And then this right eye, it's going to be looking laterally. And that's where the information is going to be lost. So corresponding to the image here, number four, we can see that the loss of visual information is coming from both right sides. So again, that's the left optic tract. We would have that contralateral homonymous hemianopsia, both sides, same sides, homonymous. Okay, next one is a patient that walked into a dark room from a light day outside suddenly felt a severely painful left eye. What is this a classic vignette of? So suddenly walked into a dark room from a light day. What is classically seen on physical exam? And how can we make the diagnosis of this condition? So this is going to be an acute angle closure glaucoma. The pupil was constricted due to the increased light as they were outside, but then they went into the dimly lit room, the dark room, and then the pupil dilated in order to get more light. So that's going to block the aqueous humor outflow through the canal of Schlem through the trabecular meshwork on each side of the eye. So that increase in the dilation of the pupil is going to block those canals of the exit of the aqueous humor, and therefore it's just going to build up. Classical and physical exam is going to show a cloudy, steamy cornea and a mid-dilated fixed pupil. So those are the two classic things, steamy cornea and mid-dilated fixed pupil for acute angle closure glaucoma. For diagnosis, we want to do tonometry, testing the pressure of the eye chamber itself, and a pressure over 21 millimeters of mercury, and also on fundoscopy, optic disc blurring or cupping is going to be noticed. So again, the classic signs, physical exam, steamy cornea, mid-fixed dilated pupil, tonometry showing over 21, fundoscopy with optic disc blurring or cupping. Next one, what are two common medication classes that can precipitate this condition? So what are two medication classes that we don't want to use because they have a contraindication in this condition? And also, what is our management for this condition overall anyways? So that's going to be sympathomimetics. They dilate the pupil. And anticholinergics, which they block the parasympathetic. So in essence, they're increasing the sympathetic. So blocking the parasympathetic, which would normally constrict the pupil, leading to meiosis. Topical plus systemic, we want to do for acute angle closure. We could do something like topical timolol, a beta blocker, apriclonidine, or pilocarpine with PO or IV acetazolamide. So again, with PO or IV acetazolamide. Next one is slow, progressive, painless, bilateral, peripheral vision loss that some state is like tunnel vision. What is that? So again, tunnel vision, slow, progressive, painless, bilateral, peripheral vision loss. What is the best agent for this condition to use? And if medical treatment fails, then what? So what do we do after medical treatment if it fails? That's going to be chronic open-angle glaucoma, 
prostaglandin analogs like letanoprost are first line. So again, in chronic angle, prostaglandin analogs, but not in acute angle closure glaucoma. Laser trabeculoplasty increases the outflow of aqueous humor, and that's what we can do after refractory to medical treatment. Again, for chronic open angle glaucoma. Next one is a 60-year-old patient with a history of stroke that comes in stating that last week he noticed one eye completely went black with no vision, but only lasted 20 minutes, and now he can completely see fine. He was wondering what happened. So again, it completely went black with no vision. He's 60 years old and a history of a stroke. What is this called? What is the classic description by the patient? And what is the biggest risk factor? So what, how do they classically describe this? And what's the biggest risk factor for this condition? That's going to be amaurosis fugo. I don't know how to technically pronounce it, but fugo, amaurosis fugo, curtain coming down, and then lifts up within an hour. So how they're going to classically describe it is a curtain coming down, and then it lifts up within an hour. Visual loss descending over the visual field, they might say. Also, transient monocular vision loss due to retinal emboli or ischemia is the cause. Many different conditions can manifest this. So again, retinal emboli or ischemia, most common cause. Next one, a couple pathognomonic terms. Blood and thunder appearance makes you think of what? So if you see blood and thunder appearance, what do you think of that? How about boxcar appearance with a cherry red macula and a pale retina makes you think of what? So again, blood and thunder versus a boxcar appearance with a cherry red macula and a pale retina. So the first one, the blood and thunder, that's going to be a CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion. And the boxcar appearance with cherry red macula, that's going to be central retinal artery occlusion. What is the most common cause of a central retinal artery occlusion? And our central retinal artery occlusion and central retinal vein occlusion, are they painful? Most common cause and are they painful or not? So central retinal artery occlusion is embolic as the most common cause in emboli usually in a patient with atherosclerosis of the carotid artery. Both are also not painful, and they're both monocular as well, one eye. But again, not painful typically. Next one, on the physical exam of an eight-year-old, you find pain when you push on the tragus and erythema and swelling of the external auditory canal. His mom says he's been itching his ear as well. What is the diagnosis based on these symptoms? What is the biggest risk factor for this condition? And what happens physiologically to make this a risk factor? So again, what's the biggest risk factor and what happens physiologically to actually make this a risk factor? What is the most common organism for this condition? What is the treatment? And if we can't identify if the TM is perforated or not, what should we not give as treatment? So if we can't see if the TM is perforated or not, what do we not want to get? So this is of course otitis externa. Swimming is the biggest risk factor, swimming, and it's due to excess moisture, which raises the pH, making it more alkalotic, and therefore the normal pH, which is typically acidic, that helps keep bacteria at bay, not growing, it gets diluted, so therefore there's a better environment for bacteria to grow. So that's why swimming is a risk factor for otitis externa. Pseudomotus is the biggest cause of this external. Ciprodex, ciprofloxacin, and dexamethasone can be used, or ofloxacin topically. We don't want to use aminoglycosides because they're ototoxic if perforation of the tympanic membrane is suspected. So again, no aminoglycosides. Remember, they're ototoxic as well. That would be like streptomycin, tobramycin, gentamicin, etc. A 65-year-old diabetic, you note extreme pain with traction of the auricle. The, the patient is very ill-appearing. What diagnosis is suspected? So again, 65-year-old diabetic. Extreme pain with traction of the auricle. The patient is very ill appearing. What is the diagnosis suspected? The most common cause is what? The treatment is what? And how do you diagnose and assess severity in this patient? So this is going to be malignant otitis externa. Diabetes mellitus is a risk factor because they're immunocompromised. Pseudomonas, same thing as otitis externa, but this is malignant. Um, Pseudomonas, biggest, risk, biggest uh, cause in this condition. How do we treat them? Admit them, they are immunocompromised, and do IV ciprofloxacin. Otoscopy will see edema, erythema, and granulation tissue at the bony cartilaginous junction of the ear canal floor. They could also have frank necrosis of the canal as it erodes downward and is an invasive infection of the external auditory canal and skull base progression. 
So the skull base, it progresses through that area. We want to confirm the progression with CT or MRI. So how do we diagnose and assess severity? The answer to that is CT or MRI. Next one is a one-year-old that has had a previous ear infection two weeks ago that was elected to do treatment conservatively. They would come back in and state the mom said that the child has a large right of bump just posteriorly to the oracle, and it appears the ear is protruding out as well as a fever. What's the diagnosis? So again, one-year-old, he just had a previous ear infection. Now he's having a red bump posteriorly to the ear, and the ear is protruding out, and he also has a fever. What is this? How do we make this diagnosis? And what is the treatment for this condition? So that's going to be mastoiditis. Mastoiditis, CT with contrast is the first line to make the diagnosis and again to see that progression. So again, mastoiditis with a CT. We want to do IV antibiotics, IV vanc plus cefepime to cover the gram negative or potentially pseudomonas or piptazo, broad spectrum, with mastoid drainage, which is called a myringotomy. Again, mastoid drainage is a myringotomy. We might need tympanostomy tubes too, since he just had that middle ear infection as well. If it's severe and refractory, we may need to do a mastoidectomy, a complication of acute otitis media, uh, mastoiditis is, and it's most common in their under two years old. So know this is a progression from acute otitis media, like we said, previous ear infection two weeks ago. How do we define chronic otitis media? So how is that defined, chronic otitis media? What is the most common bacteria in a chronic otitis media? So chronic otitis media is defined as perforated tympanic membrane of over six weeks with persistent or recurrent purulent otorrhea that is often painless. Pseudomotus is the most common cause of chronic otitis media. So not acute otitis media, but chronic otitis media. You want to be thinking pseudomonas. And how is that defined? Perforated tympanic membrane and over six weeks of persistent or recurrent purulent drainage. Next one is a nine month old that comes in and his mom states he has been pulling his ear and feeding poorly for the past few days. She also states that he has had a cold last week and now has a mild fever. What does he have? So again, he's been pulling his ear. It's a nine month old. He just had a, a cold a few days ago and now has a mild fever. Why is this condition most common in this age group? So what anatomically predisposes these kids to this condition? What is the most common and what is the top three most common causes? And also what is classically seen on otoscopy and what is the treatment? So quite a few questions for this condition. It's a real common one. It's gonna be acute otitis media. Acute otitis media, anatomically, why kids get it more is that the eustachian tube is more horizontal and narrower and also shorter. So therefore bacteria can easily get to it as opposed to in adults where it's more vertical and bacteria have to ascend further into a more difficult terrain. Strep pneumo is the most common cause overall, but the three most common are strep pneumo, Morxella catarralis, and Haemophilus influenza. What is classically seen? It's going to be a bulging erythematous tympanic membrane with decreased mobility. And that decreased mobility, that's the most specific sign for this. So if they ask you what is the most specific sign, and they give you signs of acute otitis media, then you want to be thinking of that decreased mobility of the tympanic membrane as the most specific. We can do amoxicillin with second line augmentin in this condition. Next one is a patient with acute otitis media has had an intense feeling of acute ear pain and then relief with a discharge of otorrhea. What just occurred and how long does it take to heal? So again, an intense feeling of acute pain and then a relief with a discharge of otorrhea. What just occurred and how long does it take to heal? What are they at risk for developing as well with a condition such as this? Tympanic membrane rupture. So that's classically the tympanic me membrane rupture and it takes one to two days to heal. This also is a risk for developing a cholesteatoma. So cholesteatoma after a tympanic membrane rupture. Next one is a patient with a history of eustachian tube dysfunction has what appears to be bubbling with a level of fluid behind the tympanic membrane. What's the diagnosis? So again, eustachian tube dysfunction appears to be bubbling behind the tympanic membrane. What will be seen on pneumatic otoscope? It's going to be serous otitis media with effusion because they have that bubbling. You'll see traction or retraction of the tympanic membrane with hypomobility. So again, it'll be retracted and sucked in with hypomobility with effusion. 
A patient with a history of a viral URI complains of popping in the ears and a feeling of being underwater. He also states he feels a little off balance at times. What is likely going on? What can we advise for treatment of this condition? This is going to be eustachian tube dysfunction. Eustachian tube dysfunction. We can advise them to do auto insulfation, auto insulfation, yawning, swallowing, blowing against a pinched nostril as well can auto insulfate. Also decongestants for those remaining congestive symptoms. So decongestants, auto insufflation for eustachian tube dysfunction. Next one is a patient complaining of hearing loss in the right ear. You do a Rene test and note bone conduction greater than air conduction in that ear. So again, hearing loss in the right ear, bone conduction greater than air conduction in that right ear. What type of hearing loss do you think they have? <clears throat> so again, hearing loss in the right ear. Rene shows a bone conduction over air conduction. What type of hearing loss? What is the most common cause of this type of hearing loss? And we'll go over two more questions before we say the answer. A patient comes in with a left-sided hearing loss and you do the Weber test and it localizes to the right ear. So again, they have hearing loss on this left side of the ear, but it's localizing to the good ear, the right side of the ear. What kind of hearing loss do they have? What is the most common cause of this type of hearing loss? So two different types here. First one is going to be conductive hearing loss. And the most common cause of conductive hearing loss is cerumen impaction. Cerumen impaction. The second one is going to be sensory neural hearing loss. And presbycusis is the most common cause of sensory neural hearing loss. So again, sensory neural hearing loss. Patient came in with left-sided hearing loss, but they heard it better on the right side. So that's going to be sensory neural hearing loss. Next one. If you, had, if you had conductive hearing loss and you perform the Weber test, which ear will it lateralize to? If you have conductive hearing loss and you perform the Weber test, which ear will it, will it lateralize to, the good or the bad ear? And also, what chemical do you use to soften cerumen? So if you perform the Weber test and you have conductive hearing loss, it will go to the affected ear because there's a blockage in that ear, conductive hearing loss. There's, again, there's a blockage or conductive hearing loss in the right ear, for instance, the sound will go to that ear because the Weber is testing sensory neural. If there's a blockage, the lack of sound on that side will make it seem like the sound is louder on that side because there's no interference from aberrant sound of conduction. You're getting purely sensory neural. So again, if there's a blockage in that ear, it's gonna go to that ear because the Weber is gonna show sensory neural. So if there's cerumen impaction, for instance, let's say, as a conductive hearing loss, that's going to impair some of the outside sound going to that ear. So therefore, it's going to seemingly be uh, louder in that ear. And uh, cerumen impaction, to soften the cerumen, we can use hydrogen peroxide or carbamide peroxide. Important to know. Next one is a patient that has odorrhea with a strong odor. They know it's brown or yellow in color. They have a chronic history of otitis media. On otoscopy, you find cellular debris and granulation tissue in the ear. What is this diagnosis? So classic findings here. Odorrhea with a strong odor, history of chronic otitis media, cellular debris, and granulation tissue in that ear. What type of hearing loss will this be? What is the histology? And how do we manage this? So important to know. That's going to be cholesteatoma. It's going to be a conductive hearing loss, so therefore, um, on the Weber test, it's going to lateralize to the affected ear again because it's blocking that interference of the sound outside. Weber test is testing the sensory neural component, so again, louder in the affected ear. It's going to be on histology keratinized collection of desquamated squamous epithelium. It also leads to bony erosion of the mastoid, cholesteatoma does. That's why we need to do surgical excision of the debris and reconstruction of the ossicles. Next one is a 30-year-old patient coming in with complaints of hearing loss. They're worried because their mom had had early hearing loss and had to have some type of procedure followed by hearing aids at a young age. What condition does this patient have? So again, a 30-year-old hearing loss, some, fam some familial problems with hearing. What frequencies will this patient initially experience loss of? What frequencies? That's going to be otosclerosis. It's an autosomal dominant condition. That's why it runs in her family. Loss of low frequencies is noticed. Loss of low frequencies. It's conductive hearing loss. Again, the vignette will have a family history. 
no vertigo. You might need to do a stapedectomy. It's the bony shape of the overgrowth of the stapes. Again, otosclerosis is of that stapes itself. That's why you need to do a stapedectomy potentially with a prosthesis or hearing aid as the treatment option. So again, that bony overgrowth that is autosomal dominant is otosclerosis. Next one is a patient that has vertical nystagmus that is non-fatigable. Again, vertical nystagmus, non-fatigable. He states these symptoms have occurred gradually over a long period of time. You also note gait issues on exam. What type of vertigo are you concerned may be the etiology. So what type of vertigo does this patient have? What are some examples of this etiology as well? So this is going to be central vertigo, as we have VNC is how I remember it. VNC, vertical, non-fatigable, is a central cause. So VNC, vertical nystagmus, that's non-fatigable, equals a central cause, and also plus other CNS symptoms such as gait and also gradual onset. So gradual onset. What you want to be concerned of is brain tumor, MS, vestibular neuroma, CVA, or a migraine. So these are some of the causes of a central cause of vertigo as it does have a gradual onset, and you may have other CNS symptoms. Next one is horizontal nystagmus that is fatigable and acute in onset, has a likely origination of wear. So again, horizontal, fatigable, acute onset. That's going to be HFA, is how I remember it, horizontal, fatigable, and acute, and that equals peripheral. So it's a peripheral cause of vertigo. And some of those peripheral causes have anything to do with in the labyrinth or in the um, vestibular system of the ear in the cochlea. So those are all peripheral causes of vertigo. And again, that's HFA, horizontal, fatigable, and acute equals peripheral. Next one, we're going to talk about nausea and vomiting a little bit. Physiologically, how does nausea and vomiting come about? So how does this actually come about, nausea and vomiting? What is the first line antiemetic for vertigo and motion sickness? What two conditions? Are these medications contraindicated in? So again, physiologically, how does nausea vomiting come about? First line for vertigo and motion sickness. What are contraindicated? Comes about by the sensory conflict between the neurotransmitters. So some of these neurotransmitters are histamine, serotonin, dopamine, GABA, and acetylcholine. And there's sensory conflict between those, which leads to that nausea and vomiting. The first line antiemetic for vertigo and motion sickness is antihistamines or anticholinergics. For example, that would be like meclizine, scopolamine, diamondhydronate, and diphenhydramine. Acute narrow angle closure glaucoma is a contraindication as it would lead to madriasis and closes the angle. BPH with urinary retention as well decreases the parasympathetic, which will tighten the urethra. Again, decreasing the parasympathetic would tighten the urethra. And madriasis, opening the eyes, would actually close the angle and lead to a buildup of the aqueous humor and that's if you're blocking that parasympathetic. Next one, prochlorperazine, metaclopramide, and promethazine work by what mechanism of action to control nausea and vomiting? What are the two big side effects that we must know with these medications? Two big side effects. We add what medication to prevent one of these side effects? So it's important to know what do we add when we're dealing with these three medications. So that mechanism is going to be dopamine inhibition. Um, just like antipsychotics, and that's why we need to give an anticholinergic to prevent those dystonic reactions. Dystonic reactions is one of those side effects, and we give an anticholinergic at the same time to balance this out. We have to bring both neurotransmitters down, dopamine and acetylcholine, just like we give an anticholinergic in Parkinson's when we're increasing the dopamine to relieve those symptoms by inhibiting acetylcholine in Parkinson's. And another side effect is also QT prolongation. And antipsychotics also have that side effect too. So again, those two side effects of those anti-dopaminergics, prochlorperazine, metaclopamide, and promethazine, are going to be dystonic reactions reduced by anticholinergics like Benadryl, and also QT prolongation is important to know. Next one is what other life-threatening syndrome could occur due to dopamine blockade that also occurs in newbies to antipsychotics, and how do we treat that? That's going to be neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and we want to give BAD, that's how I remember it, B-A-D, bromocryptine, amantadine, and dantrolene. So you give one of those for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Okay, next patient comes in with a sudden onset of dizziness with no hearing loss. He notes it comes on with specific motions and goes away in about a minute with other random motions. 
he notes also some nausea. What is the diagnosis? What is the pathophysiology of this condition? What do we want to do to diagnose him? And how about to treat him? There's some specific maneuvers that we should do in this condition. So that's going to be benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, BPV, BPPV. And it lasts for under 60 seconds with no hearing loss, just like we saw in this patient. We want to diagnose it with the Dix Hall Pike maneuver. And also to treat it, we can do the Epley maneuver. So don't forget to diagnose Dix Hall Pike to treat Epley maneuver. The pathophysiology is due to a displaced otolith particles within the semicircular canals of the inner ear. That's called canalithiasis. So those displaced otolith particles. Next one, a patient just got over a viral URI and now has continuous vertigo and no hearing loss. What is this? So that BPPV just had um, short-term intermittent vertigo with no hearing loss, but now this patient has continuous vertigo with no hearing loss. What condition is this? A patient has continuous vertigo and hearing loss. What is this? And what is the treatment first line for both? So these are slightly different. One of them, they both have continuous vertigo, but one of them has hearing loss and one of them does not have hearing loss. What, what are those and how do we differentiate them? So no hearing loss in continuous vertigo, like our first patient, is going to be vestibular neuritis. Only the vestibular nerve is affected. So they're not having hearing loss, so it's not the cochlear nerve portion of the cranial nerve 8, but it is the vestibular portion. That's why they're having that continuous vertigo. So you want to be thinking vestibular neuritis. Hearing loss plus continuous vertigo, so they're having both, is labyrinthitis. So this is both of them. It involves both. It's the worst. And glucocorticoids are first line for these. So again, hearing loss plus continuous vertigo, which is labyrinthitis, which is a little bit worse. And again, vestibular, neur vestibular neuritis is just continuous vertigo with no hearing loss. Next one is a patient with episodic vertigo plus hearing loss of especially low tones. What is that? They also have an ear fullness, which might give it away. So ear fullness, low tones, episodic vertigo, not continuous vertigo like the two conditions above, vestibular neuritis and labyrinthitis but rather episodic vertigo plus hearing loss. <clears throat> what is that? What is the problem in this condition and what is the initial treatment? So important to know what the initial treatment is. This is gonna be Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease is also called idiopathic endolymphatic high drops. It is equal to distension of the compartment of the inner ear from excess fluid. So that's how it happens, excess fluid in the inner ear. Remember, it's also episodic vertigo but it also has hearing loss. So episodic vertigo with hearing loss. Diet modifications are the first step. We want to decrease salt, especially. Avoid caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol. And if that doesn't work, we can use hydrochlorothiazide if no relief. Next one important to know, solely unilateral sensory neural hearing loss is what until proven otherwise? Unilateral sensory neural hearing loss is what until proven otherwise? What does this involve exactly? What cranial nerves are involved? And what are the two diagnostic assessment tools used in this condition? Two diagnostic assessment tools used. It's going to be an acoustic neuroma, a vestibular schwannoma. It arises from the swan cells that produce the myelin sheath. It's, it involves cranial nerves 7, 8, and 10. And it might show signs of these palsies like facial nerve and especially the hearing loss. We had cranial 8 involved. You want to get an MRI and also audiometry as the two ways to assess this. So the audiometry assesses the unilateral hearing loss and the MRI actually assesses the tumor itself. So again, acoustic neuroma, you want to be thinking of in sensory neural hearing loss that's unilateral is the first thing you want to think of. Okay, next one, going into some sinus disorders, sinusitis for five weeks is classified as what? So they have sinusitis for five weeks. What is that technically in the classification of? What is defined as chronic sinusitis? What is defined as chronic? What is defined as five weeks of sinusitis? What is the most common overall pathogen after viral? And what are the three most common overall for sinusitis? So the first question there is going to be subacute since it's five weeks. 1 to 4 is acute, 4 to 12 is subacute, and over 12 is chronic. Important to know the durations there. The most common cause overall is strep pneumoniae, H flu, and uh, Morxella cataralis is third. 
So strep pneumo, H. flu, and Mark's Cataracts, the biggest three. In refractory sinusitis, what is the best imaging modality to get? So what do we want to, how do we want to image their sinuses in refractory sinusitis? What radiographic view, if we had to get one, would be best? What radiographic view? And what are the treatment considerations in this condition? What are the treatment considerations? So refractory sinusitis, we can get a CT if needed. The x-ray would be a Waters view x-ray if we did do a uh, x-ray. And it must be over 10 to 14 days to treat with antibiotics. And if we do treat with antibiotics over 10 to 14 days, we want to do Augmentin with a second line of doxycycline. So Augmentin first line, second line is doxycycline, especially if they're over, or rather only if they're over 10 to 14 days. Prior to 10 days, we can do supportive management like decongestants, intranasal glucocorticoids, and also antihistamines as well. How do we diagnose chronic sinusitis? So how do we actually diagnose that? What is the most common bacterial cause and the most common fungal cause of chronic sinusitis? So we said chronic is what? Over 12 weeks, chronic sinusitis. What vasculitis leads to chronic sinusitis and a saddle nose deformity? So what vasculitis leads to chronic sinusitis and a saddle nose deformity? That's gonna be over 12 weeks, like we said. We wanna do a biopsy and histologic study. So interestingly, over 12 weeks, we wanna do biopsy. It's been refractory so far, so we need to do something more to figure out what's going on. Bacteria is Staph aureus as the most common cause, and fungal is Aspergillus. And mucormycosis is the second most common. So bacterial is Staph aureus, fungal is Aspergillus. And that vasculitis is called Wegener's granulomatosis. And remember, it has a C anchor positivity. So that's Wegener's granulomatosis. Next one is a 55-year-old poorly controlled diabetic that was on chronic corticosteroids that comes in with symptoms of sinusitis, as well as a black eschar on the cheek extending to the nasal mucosa. What is this? So again, controlled, poorly controlled diabetes, chronic corticosteroids, sinusitis, black eschar. What is that? What are the four main causes of this? So there's four main causes. What will we see on biopsy? And what is the best test for this condition? And what in treatment is what two things? So what two things are in the treatment here? That's going to be mucormycosis. I remember this is MRCA, almost like MRSA, MRSA, but this is MRSA with a C. So MRCA, mucor, rhizopus, cunninghamella, and obsidia. So those are the four causes of mucormycosis. The classic things that we're going to see are non-septate, broad hyphae with an irregular right angle pattern. We want to debride it surgically in IV amphotericin B. So again, debride surgically and IV amphotericin B are the two things that we need to do for treatment for this condition. <clears throat> Next one is a patient comes in with pale, violaceous, foggy termitids, nasal polyps, and a cobblestone mucosa of the conjunctiva. They also have purple discoloration around the eyes and a crease ridge atop the nose. What are these all classic findings indicating? What is the first line treatment? What should we educate the patients on in regards to decongestant use in this condition? So how do we educate them on decongestant use in this condition? Of course, this is gonna be allergic rhinitis. Those are all signs of allergy. Intranasal corticosteroids is the first line. That's the thing that has the best efficacy in this condition. And that's gonna be things like fluticasone or mometasone. Works best for this condition, especially if polyps are there too. How do we want to educate them in regards to decongestants? We want to educate them about rhinitis and medicamentosa, which is rebound congestion after three to five days of the use of things like afrin, oxymetazoline, and phenylephrine. They're all vasoconstrictors and sympathomimetics that constrict those vessels that decrease the congestion, but they can have that rebound congestion after they abruptly stop this medication. So a five-year-old patient comes in with a nosebleed that has not stopped after 15 minutes of pressure and leaning forward. What is the next step? So again, five-year-old, he's already tried 15 minutes of pressure and leaning forward. What's the next step? How about if that step doesn't work? And how about if that step doesn't work? So basically, what are the four steps in a row that you would do if each um, subsequent step does not work? If it's anterior in origin, what plexus is involved? Importantly to know. And what is the most common cause of this condition in children? So first, always direct pressure for the first 15 minutes and lean forward. Then the second line option after that fails is vasoconstrictors topically. That would be like oxymetazoline, even cocaine, 
lidocaine with epi can be used as well. So vasoconstrictor second, and then third is cauterization with silver nitrate or electrocautery. And then lastly is nasal packing. So interestingly, lastly is nasal packing. The anterior is Kesselbach's plexus and nose picking is the most common cause, especially in kids. So nose picking, most common cause, anterior, nosebleed is Kesselbach's plexus. And again, just to run through them, direct pressure for 15 minutes and leaning forward, vasoconstrictors, cauterization, and then lastly, nasal packing. So how about if they have a posterior nosebleed? And also how do we manage the posterior nosebleed right away? And what plexus also is involved in a posterior nosebleed? So sphenopalatine artery branches in Woodruff's plexus is the most common for a posterior nosebleed. Again, sphenopalatine artery branches in Woodruff's plexus. We said Kesselbach's plexus for anterior, Woodruff's plexus for posterior. Right away for posterior, we wanna do a balloon catheter right away that may cause bleeding into both nares, the posterior uh, nosebleed will, and is more serious and more likely to affect older patients and hypertensives. So one of the ways we can determine based on the history is, is it bleeding from both nares? If it is, then we want to be, and it's an older patient as well, then we want to, want to be considering posterior nosebleed. And again, balloon catheter for posterior nosebleed. A two-year-old is brought by his mother due to a nosebleed and some draining yellow mucus for three days, only the right nostrils involved. His mom notes that he's been breathing from his mouth. What are you thinking? So again, three days, yellow mucus, he has a nosebleed too, and he's breathing from the mouth. What do you think? What are two things you could do to solve this condition? It's gonna be a nasal foreign body. So nasal foreign body, those are the classic signs of a nasal foreign body. You can either pick it out with an instrument, like a, some kind of grasper to actually pick the, the foreign body out, or you can do a positive pressure in the mouth while occluding the patent nostril. So it just kind of pops it out the other nostril. Those are the two things you can do for a nasal foreign body. A 10 year old, coming in with a fever of 101, also sore throat, pain with swallowing, and headache. What are the components of the criteria you could use to make this diagnosis? So again, what are the components of the criteria to make this diagnosis? What is the best treatment? How about if they have an allergy to this treatment? What are three complications of this condition? And which one cannot be prevented even with proper treatment? This is an important one to know. It's gonna be strep pharyngitis, group A beta hemolytic strep, strep pyogenes, same thing. This is strep pharyngitis again. Centaur criteria is the criteria you, you can use for this. And that would involve a fever, anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, and what is posterior cervical lymphadenopathy associated with? So posterior cervical lymphadenopathy, that's gonna be with EBV, um, infectious mononucleosis, but anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, that's in the centaur criteria for a strep. So again, fever, anterior cervical lymphadenopathy, absence of cough. So a cough is less likely to be had in strep pharyngitis and also white exudates on the tonsil. So those are the four things that you wanna be thinking of for the central criteria. So amoxicillin or penicillin is first line. If they are allergic, then we can do a macrolide or we can do clindamycin as well. And glomerulonephritis is the one that we cannot prevent so that they could occur, especially in 10 to 15 year olds. So again, glomerulonephritis, that's classically T-colored or Kohler-colored post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which is not preventable, whereas rheumatic fever and peritonsillar abscess are preventable. So those are the three complications that we should know for strep pharyngitis. Again, glomerulonephritis, peritonsillar abscess, and rheumatic fever. Peritonsillar abscess and rheumatic fever are preventable. Next one, an opera singer has complaints of hoarseness of voice, which has prevented them from singing as usual. What is the diagnosis? What are two other etiologies for this condition as opposed to being an opera singer? So that's gonna be laryngitis, laryngitis. This could also be from GERD and it could also be viral. So this one is from irritation from the opera singer just using the voice too much, but it also could be from GERD, from the acid reflux and also a viral infection of the larynx. So next patient is a 20 year old female that has dysphagia, high fever, drooling, and recent sore throat and trismus, lockjaw. What is this? What is another classic manifestation not mentioned in this vignette? So another classic manifestation. What is another important PE sign, physical exam sign, that you should look for always when considering this diagnosis? So when you look in the throat, what are you looking for? What is the most common cause of this? And how do we treat them as well? Important to know, obviously. 
So peritonsillar abscess is this condition. She just had an upper respiratory strep throat, and now she's having trismus, lockjaw, and uh, drooling as well. So difficult, difficulty handling secretions. That other classic sign that should be in the uh, manifestations as a muffled hot potato voice. So a muffled hot potato voice in PTA. They may have a swollen or fluctuant tonsil, but you can't miss uvular deviation. So on physical exam, that sign that we were referring to was that uvular deviation to the contralateral side. So bulging of that fluctuant abscess in one side is going to push over the uvula to the other side. And that's one of those classic signs for a PTA. Um, group A, beta hemolytic strep, strep pyogenes is the cause. Clindamycin can be used as well as augmentin. And you could do incision and drainage or needle aspiration with, for that fluctuant abscess as well. It's not just amoxicillin for this condition. If you sense that it's a PTA, you want to be doing Clinda or Augmentin. A patient comes in with a stiff neck. He notes he accidentally swallowed a fish bone the other day. He also has a fever. What's the diagnosis? So here, a triad of some uh, constellation of symptoms that should clue you off to what this diagnosis is. What is a good first imaging to get, and what will it show us? And also, what is the definitive imaging? So good first imaging to get, what will it show us? And what is the definitive imaging? This is a retropharyngeal abscess. You can get a neck x-ray to start, and you'll see pre-vertebral space that increases about 50%. So right in front of the vertebrae anteriorly, we're going to see that that space increases because that's where the abscess is. We could do also a CT if there's high suspicion. That will be more definitive. For the treatment, we could observe them with antibiotics for four, 48 hours if it's mild. Otherwise, we need to do drainage in the OR, likely. And also, mediastin mediastinitis is a risk factor because that space connects there inferiorly to the mediastinum. Next patient is a patient with hepatitis C virus. Also notes some white reticular patterns in their mouth. It is not painful. What is the diagnosis based on these findings? How should we treat this condition? So again, hepatitis C, white reticular pattern in the mouth, not painful. It's going to be oral lichen planus. So oral lichen planus. This is a lacy white reticular pattern, which is also called Wickham striae. If you remember from the dermatology unit, Wickham striae in the mouth and corticosteroids are the treatment. <clears throat> Next one, a patient with diabetes mellitus and gingivitis is noted to have swelling under their jaw and upper neck that is very painful. You also know an erythematous shade to the skin as well in that area. The patient's temp is 102.6. What is this condition? So again, gingivitis, diabetic, upper neck pain, and also rash, erythematous shade of color. It's going to be Ludwig's angina, Ludwig's angina. A rapid spread of cellulitis on the floor of the mouth in the submandibular space. Increase in immunocompromise and diabetics and in poor dental condition. Classically, what, what they'll describe it as is as woody in duration. Woody in duration, a risk for airway compromise could be possible. And also you want to treat after a CT to confirm where it exactly is. And what you could use is ampicillin sulbactam, ceftriaxone, and metronidazole, and clinda and levofloxacin. So broad spectrum covering anaerobes as well as gram negatives. Next one is a diabetic with asthma. So a diabetic with asthma is complaining about a white rash that is in the back of the tongue. She says it bleeds when she tries to scrape it off using a tongue scraper. What is the likely cause of this condition? So that kind of gives it away. It bleeds when it, she tries to scrape it off. It's a white rash and she's a diabetic and she's also using some kind of treatment for asthma. How do we make the diagnosis and what's the best treatment? Oral pharyngeal candidiasis, thrush. So that's what it is. KOH prep is how we make the diagnosis, of course. And we see the classic budding yeast with pseudo hyphae on that KOH prep. The white curd-like plaques that can be scraped off and may bleed. The first line is nice statin, swish and swallow, also clotrimazole trochs. Educate them on using a spacer with the inhaled corticosteroid for their asthma. So especially if they're using an inhaled corticosteroid for their asthma and they're diabetic, they have way increased chances of getting oropharyngeal candidiasis, especially if they're not using that spacer correctly. Next one, what is a condition also found in Crohn's that is described as painful, shallow, erythematous, oval with white, yellow, or gray central exudate with an erythematous halo more common on the buccal mucosa. So again, more common in Crohn's disease as well. 
how do we treat the pain accompanying this condition and the condition itself? So how do we treat the pain and the condition itself? It's going to be aptus ulcers, oral aptus ulcers. For the pain, you can do 2% viscous lidocaine. For the condition itself, topical oral glucocorticoids can be used. Next one, what are oral painless white patches that cannot be scraped off? Oral painless white patches that cannot be scraped off. How about oral painless red soft velvety patches that cannot be scraped off? What percentages of each of these conditions are associated with a further pathologic condition? So each of these are associated with that same condition. What percentage of each of them? First one's going to be oral leukoplakia. Oral leukoplakia that cannot be scraped off. Remember, candidiasis can be scraped off. And about 6% is, is going to become squamous cell carcinoma. As opposed to the second one, again, a painless red soft velvety patch. That's a oral erythroplakia. And 90% of those become squamous cell carcinoma. So important to know, oral leukoplakia, 6% to squamous cell carcinoma. And oral erythroplakia, 90% become squamous cell carcinoma. A patient comes in due to recurrent pain just prior to eating. She notes the pain is in the cheek area. Based on the history alone, what is this? So recurrent pain just prior to eating. It's in the cheek area. Based on the history, what is this? What are the two areas this is most common in? What is the first line treatment? So it's going to be sialolithiasis, salivary gland stones. The most common locations, the two most common, are Wharton's duct, which is the submandibular gland, and also Stenson's duct, which is the parotid gland. So important to know Wharton's duct and Stenson's duct. And don't get confused with Wharton's duct and Woodruff's plexus in posterior um, nosebleed and Kesselbach's plexus in anterior nosebleed. Wharton's duct, not Woodruff's. Wharton's is submandibular gland and Stenson's is the parotid gland. We can do sialogogues, sialogogues, which are tart candy, lemon drops that increase that salivary outflow. So kind of like a kidney stone where you want to increase your fluid intake. Same thing with this. You want those um, salivary glands to start squeezing and uh, excreting more salivary flow. You want to avoid anticholinergics. Obviously, they're going to lead to that dry mouth and you want them to stay hydrated as well. Next one, a patient has not gotten better after a few weeks and now notices redness around her cheeks and fever. So the same patient, she hesitates to open the mouth on exam and is extremely painful now. On palpation, you're able to express some pus. What is this condition? So again, that same patient with this problem, now it's gotten worse, painful, you can express some pus on physical exam. What is the most common cause? What are two things should be included in the treatment. So two things. We already mentioned one. So that's going to be suppurative sialadenitis. Suppurative sialadenitis. Staph aureus, again, the most common cause of that. Sialagogues we want to use as part of the treatment, and also an anti-staph antibiotic, like dicloxacillin or nafcillin to take care of that staph aureus. So again, staph aureus, you want to use dicloxacillin, nafcillin, etc., and sialagogues for suppurative sialadenitis. Next condition, what is a condition that is described as ulcerative lesions of the gingiva, gum swelling and friability with bleeding, with vesicles clustered on an erythematous base? So that's classic. Vesicles clustered on an erythematous base. Acute herpetic gingivostomatitis, and that's HSV1. Um, supportive and oral acyclovir is the treatment. Next one is a painless, white, smooth, hairy plaque that is along the lateral tongue and cannot be scraped off and is associated with HIV and Epstein-Barr virus is what? So again, associated with Epstein-Barr virus and HIV, a white, smooth, hairy plaque, especially on the lateral side of the tongue border. It's painless as well. That's going to be oral hairy leukoplakia, oral hairy leukoplakia. So don't forget that EBV and HIV are associated with that oral hairy leukoplakia, which isn't the same as the leukoplakia and erythroplakia that we, can, um, that we compared and contrasted earlier. And last question, what diuretics are ototoxic and how about what antibiotics are ototoxic? So it's important to know some ototoxic antibiotics and diuretics, which ones are those? So those are going to be loops, loop diuretics are ototoxic, ethacrinic acid especially is the most ototoxic. Ethacrinic acid is the most ototoxic. And when do we want to even use ethacrinic acid? It's like a less common one. But we use that if 
from the cardiology unit. Ethocrinic acid is used when there's a sulfa allergy. So you're trading, you're trading enough so that you can use the loop diuretic in that sulfa allergy, but it is more ototoxic. Bumetanide and furosemide are also loops, and they are a little bit ototoxic as well. Antibiotics that are ototoxic, vancomycin, and also aminoglycosides, which are the Stang antibiotics, streptomycin, tobramycin, amikacin, neomycin, and gentamicin, those are your Stang antibiotics, and those are all ototoxic as well. And that will complete our EENT unit. Thank you for listening. Go ahead and like and subscribe if you did like it, and we'll be back for more videos in the next one.